My name is Michelle Miller. I'm Associate Director at the Center for Integrated Ag Systems for the Sustainable Ag Research Center on the UW-Madison campus. Um, I uh, have um, had the honor of working with Matt Raboyne, um, and Matt was on our staff when he decided he was just going to go full-time making cider. So I picked up the, pro uh, the um, research project from him, and really he's the inspiration behind it. So what we're really doing is we're looking at single varietal hard cider apple flavor research. We're using both quantitative methods like lab results, lab test numbers, as well as qualitative measures um, that we are getting from tastings that we're having. Um, I think I've talked to at least some of you about um, tasting yet this afternoon. We're going to do a tasting with 15 people and eight ciders. We had uh, 40 different varieties of apples from four farms. Um, uh, uh, Cider Farm, um, Georgia's Farm, um, Supplied Apples, um, Cider House, Jim Lindemann's Place, um, Matt Raboyne, um, I think you were responsible actually for Albion Prairie's apples as well as your own, yeah. plus some wild ones in there and maybe something from Seed Savers? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, that's where the apples came from and who our partners have been. We've also had, um, thank heaven, for Nick. <laughs> um, uh, Nick Smith and, um, is new to, relatively new to campus, and he's with the fermentation lab on campus. So he was the one that made the cider from the apples. And then uh, Julie Dawson has been working with us to um, uh, make sense of the data that we're collecting. So 40, 40 varieties from four different orchards. We took, uh, actually, Nick took pictures of them as they came in. Um, Ellie picked up the apples from the farms and delivered them, and then Nick made the cider. Um, then we had a first tasting. We had 40 bottles spread out on a big table and about 20 people tasting those 40 single varietal ciders. I just really like that picture. <laughs> um, so we of uh, e each of the 20 people um, sampled, um, um, what was it, 18 ciders? No, 16 ciders, eight, eight each. Um, and, uh, and then those uh, sheets were filled out with each different variety by code, and then that was compiled into a whole lot of data. <laughs> and then we started to make some sense of that data. So I don't know if you guys can see if there's any specific variety you want to know, I can tell you where it is on there. <laughs> and from this, we're starting to get a sense of... Um, uh, what the different flavor characteristics are, uh, what apples you might want to grow. Say um, you know that there's an apple that has very intense flavor but not very many apples, well you still might want to grow it because the apples that you get are intense and worth growing. Whereas if you had a tree that, where the apples were not intense, they were kind of weak, um, uh, but there were a lot of apples, maybe you don't want to bother with that. I mean, when all push came to shove. Um, Ellie has been working on uh, this piece. You want to talk to that for a minute? Yeah, so one thing that we're developing out of this project is a report um, that goes into detail with each of, the, each of the 40 varieties that we're looking at in specific. So this is combining the, um, the data analysis part of our project with pictures along with horticultural notes that we're getting from the growers and also just researching um, on our own. So. This will be, when it's finished, it's still in the works right now, but it'll be more of a report um, where people can go and see details on each of the single varieties. I don't know how we're going to distribute it yet, but in the works, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be online for free. Um, and, um, well, I'll just go to the next couple slides. Um, we're going to uh, figure out which of those trees really ranked high or looked like they had a lot of promise for uh, flavor and building a kind of a terroir of um, hard cider in our region. And then we're asking um, the farmers that are involved in the project to provide cyan wood from those particular um, trees. And then we're having a grafting workshop um, in April. 
So I've already ordered 300 dwarf rootstock, and I've got the little knives and everything else. So we're, we're, we're getting ready for that workshop. Um, so now um, for the next three years, we've actually gotten a new um, grant proposal funded. Uh, we're going to do two more tastings on this, at least two more tastings on this project, and then we'll have those varietal results available this summer. Now um, in June, we're starting um, on kind of a next phase research. This is AFRI funded. It's another USDA program that funds agricultural research. We're working with um, Washington, Michigan, and Vermont um, to look at things like um, supply chain and distribution research. We're going to look at economics of hard cider apple production, um, specifically looking at uh, using the local food economics toolkit. Um, we're going to do some orchard walks so you can keep your eyes open for that and um, consumer intercept surveys in 2019. Um, so that's kind of the future of the project. Um, if anyone's interested in the network piece of it, um, I have a list of about 130 growers that's fairly good, um, but some of it might be old information. If you're interested in the network and you don't think you're already on our list, um, please keep your eyes open or sign up uh, at our booth um, to receive information about the network. Um, so I think I'm going to hand it over to Nick now to give you more specifics. Uh, as Ms. Shell mentioned, uh, our lab was responsible for the analysis as well as the processing of these varieties. So we had about 40-ish one-gallon batches of this to do. Uh, fortunately, I have a large, a long history of producing very small batches of wine uh, from my time at the University of Minnesota, uh, where we did obviously varietal selections of grapes. So it's pretty, very basic, straightforward production process. Anytime I try to do these varietal trials, I uh, keep things as straightforward, simple as possible, minimize as many variables. So we got the apples in. We, when Ellie brought them in, the first, things that, first thing that would happen is we put them in the cooler, uh, chill them down, sometimes a bit warm uh, during the fall. Uh, once uh, we had time, then we put them through the crusher. This is a picture of the exact crusher we have. And not the exact crusher, but from the, uh, the supplier website. So a very basic small crusher. And then this very painful little press is the model that we used <laughs> for making one gallon batches. And by we, I mean my... Uh, Laboratory assistant Cole did most of the uh, small batch pressing. So uh, once we crushed them, pressed them, uh, added 40 parts per million of uh, SO2, uh, and put everything into the cooler to settle out. So after settling, uh, we racked them off the gross leaves, added 0.4 grams per liter of a uh, nutritional or a yeast nutrition product. We use superfood uh, provided to us from BSG Wine. Uh, the yeast that I selected for this particular product was the Sav Cider for Fermentus. It uh, worked reasonably well, although I probably would use uh, DV10 or another more basic yeast in the future. This one had a bit of, I think, extra flavor to it, which for varietal trials isn't necessarily what we're looking for. I put them in the uh, incubator, uh, incubator chiller, where we can hold things at for at a, a steady tense temperature. So 60 Fahrenheit is what we fermented these at for two, for a couple of weeks after we were done. Fermenting to the best of our knowledge, we did not test specifically for final residual sugar. Uh, we chilled them down to kind of get the yeast settled out so we can rack them off the leaves and get to bottling. So it minimized the number of transfers that we did, got through fermentation, settled them out, uh, got them into bottles as quickly as we could after fermentation just to minimize any sort of oxidation that could happen. Uh, we hit them with 40 parts per million of SO2 at Bottling and then the bottles have been stored at five degrees uh, Celsius ever since production uh, finished. So it took a few weeks to get through it all. A uh, picture of our lab during the chaos. Uh, so Cole, the blur on the far, our far, my far right, uh, is doing the apple production. You can see the tiny little press uh, that he's using. Uh, Jacob is one of Amaya's students, so he was working on uh, grape research at the same time. Made for a wonderful cleanup of all of our lab, uh, as we had apples and grapes everywhere much to the uh, chagrin of the uh, dairy researchers who also share this lab. <laughs> so fortunately, uh, this ended up at uh, the evening most of the time. Uh, so there's a picture of the wines. Uh, half of the ciders after they were pressed, and you can see there's quite the color variation. Uh, there's one thing I wish I could have done is measured some of these a little bit more on their color. There's actually a few that have a bit of pigment to them and had a bit of a rosé color. So as far as analysis, we... Uh, Pretty straightforward. We did titratable acidity, bricks and pH on the juice, and uh, once things were done with fermentation, we did uh, the fullen 
method for total phenolics. We'll get into some of the results here, but the overall BRICS range, I uh, range from 10 to 18, so there's a few, few varieties that had very high BRICS. Uh, and the acidity range was quite dramatic as well, from next to almost nothing all the way up to 14 half grams per liter on this is malic acid equivalents. pH was all over the board from 2.9 to 4.43. Uh, we didn't do much adjustment on the pH either, so that could have affected some of the, uh, the ciders if they were susceptible to oxidation. Uh, and the phenolics was a, a dramatic range as well, from 360 gallic acid equivalents all the way up to 3,000. So, uh, there's some very bitter and astringent apples out there, that, that much we can tell you. So as far as the uh, 10 lowest uh, BRICS results that we have, you know, these are some of the varieties. Uh, you can see Red Delicious at 11. So Red Delicious was in there, kind of get a baseline understanding uh, as, as for comparison. And if you're looking for some alcohol production in your cider, these are some of the varieties you may want to look at. You know, Dabinet all the way up to 18 bricks. Uh, you can see Liberty was somewhere in the middle there at 14 and a half. It's a, as a good comparison as well. So a uh, bit of pH numbers here. You can see a few of these guys. Uh, the top five, they're all over four, uh, all the way up to 4.43. Yeah, it's uh, pretty dangerous at times for some of these as far as uh, stability and oxidation and spoilage. So it might be a, uh, might be a consideration. Uh, odds are most of these probably had really low acidity as well, so it's something could adjust. As far as titratable acidity, it's, uh, you know, Kappa Liberty up at 14.5 grams. It's uh, quite the bitter variety, or quite the sour variety. So a lot of characteristics, and it's, as we try to go through and, you know, well, I'm sure we'll have all this data up, and you can kind of sort through it and start to pick out ones that would fit your specific needs. Uh, you can see the uh, phenolic range was also quite long or large. I should have a question mark, I think, against Oak and Pin. Is that true? Yes. Uh, Oak and Pin is a, may or may not have been in the right map spot, but whatever this apple was, it was tremendously phenolic, or <laughs> whatever it may be. So another picture of our cider tasting. Uh, so. Julie did the uh, analysis, uh, the uh, sort of qualitative analysis, and these are the major categories that were analyzed at this initial tasting. I don't have the most recent data that may have been collected, but uh, from their first initial tasting, you know, we, you're know, obviously not going to be able to read all of those, but you can see uh, this was the acidity. I'm not going to talk much about sweetness, just in case uh, some of them maybe didn't ferment all the way. Uh, so that, you know, there might be some variants in there. Uh, appearance, I'm not going to mention either, just because at our scale, you know, we can get things on SO2 right away. So it may or may not actually reflect what you would see in the commercial production. So we'll focus on the uh, other varieties that were mentioned. So as far as acidity, uh, it traced very closely to what the analytical results were. The only one I think that was really out there, I believe, is maybe Dabinet uh, rated much more acidic than what it was analytically, uh, but if you look at the phenolic content, it was also pretty high. So there's a, so when you look at these more qualitative, we get a better understanding of the interactions between the different compounds, uh, and we're also able to break down the components of total phenolics. So total phenol includes astringency, includes bitterness, and includes a mouthfeel. So uh, by doing the qualitative analysis, we're able to break down that sort of ambiguous number to something that's more usable for everybody. So we can see astringency, the oak and pin, which had the 3,000 parts per million of gallic acid equivalent, did turn out to be the most astringently rated cider. Uh, but you can see other ciders like Tremlitz Bitter, Old Nonperial, Redfield, Crittendale Crab, those are all kind of the really more astringent, I think, trying to find Red Delicious in there, but there's a few that were much less delicious uh, right in the middle. Okay, so as far as astringency goes, if you're using Red Delicious as a comparator, uh, you can see overall there isn't a tremendous amount of variation. Uh, if, you look at, if you were to look at all these little letters, uh, it's the ones that are all the same are statistically similar. So it's only the ones that are really up high and really low that have any real statistically different values between them. Most everybody's kind of in the same range. So for bitterness, we had some standouts. Obviously, Oak and Pin is both bitter and astringent. 
Uh, but Chisel, Jersey, Dabinet, Bergier, Redfield, and Priscilla all came out as very high bidder, whereas Brown's Apple, Cap of Liberty, or Cap of Liberty, and even Liberty are all pretty low in overall bitterness. Uh, and in mouthfeel, uh, the one that stands out is the Czech standard. I should have mentioned that we did do a commercial wine or commercial cider standard or sample as a comparator. Uh, and the uh, cider house sample that we're using, cider farm, uh, did rank the highest in overall mouthfeel. Uh, but it was closely followed by Liberty, which is a variety that cider farm is very fond of as well. Uh, but you can see Kingston Black, Ellis Bitter, and Trumwitz Bitter are also very highly rated. Uh, uh, you know, those are common cider apples that we see. Uh, and please ask questions or clarification on any of these if you want or are able. Uh, and this one is cider intensity. I believe it refers to the overall flavor. So it's a hard thing. We can't really measure that one very well. So I rate about, uh, about five or so in where that big kind of wide bar is, is where our check standard was. That is the uh, cider farms. Uh, commercial cider, and you can see that all those to the right had near or more intensity of flavor. Uh, you know, and Dabinette is in the middle of Ellis Bitter and Kingston Black. So if you were to go back through all the data, you can kind of see, you know, if you're looking for something really strong flavor elements, you can kind of take a look at the ones over on the right. And this is sort of the overall uh, preference. And we see the uh, Liberty from uh, Cider House is one of the more highly, most highly preferred ciders that we had in this particular trial. The Czech standard is the one that actually did lead everybody. So the commercial standard was uh, the most well liked overall. So as far as the summary, the most astringent was the Oak and Pin, Driftless Cider, Brigier, Cap of Liberty. You know, bitterness again, Oak and Pin, but also Chisel Jersey. Dabinet, Brazier, and Redfield. Uh, some of these were, I found to be quite bitter, so bitter more than I would care for, but if you're looking for a little bitterness backbone, these would definitely help. Uh, mouthfeel, Liberty, uh, Candle, Snineup. Kingston Black and Ellis Bitter all provided quite a bit of mouthfeel, out in overall flavor, uh, and, and intensity, Cap of Liberty, Kingston Black, Tremlet's Bitter. So the ones were, you know, ones that I've heard quite a bit, I'm not as knowledgeable necessarily on the different cider apple varieties, but I've at least seen these around. And I will hand it off to Matt, whose brain ch project was his brainchild. So, <laughs> so as, as they said, I, um, I used to work at UW. I was, I was working with them. Um, and I, uh, at the same time, I had started Brick Cider along with my wife, Marie. And uh, things went more quickly than originally planned with Brick Cider, so I ended up leaving the project behind for the most part in, in, in very good hands. Um, but I stayed involved as one of the farmer collaborators. Um, so anyhow, just a little background. Um, we have an orchard near Barneveld, so it's about an hour south of here. Uh, we started planting it four years ago. Um, and yeah, we want we planted our orchard with the intention of starting a cider company, and so we wanted to grow the best apples for the best cider that we could. And um, <clears throat> there's not great information out there on you know what apples are going to do well in Wisconsin, what ones are going to make the best cider. Um, so you know our orchard is kind of a living experiment. We're um, you know we didn't have the data to say oh these five varieties are the best ones we're going to grow these five so we are pl we planted well I, I don't have an exact count of where we're at right now because we had a few that didn't make it but we're over 80 varieties in our orchard that we're trying out with the idea that hopefully we'll identify some that we really like and uh, plant more of them in the future um, and in addition to growing apples we have been getting apples so we're launching this cider business now we're going to open a tasting room and a new product production facility in mount horeb uh this spring and we got a ton of we pressed about 4500 gallons this fall to try to get ready to go and a lot of that's frozen and some of it's fermenting in a or in production in another winery um, but we got apples from 14 different locations this fall um, and we got all different kinds of apples we got some common eating apples 
Um, so things you're familiar with, Honeycrisp, Golden Delicious, Cortland, all of that. Uh, we got some heritage Wisconsin apples. So apples that, that started in Wisconsin or were first discovered in Wisconsin growing from, from seedlings. Um, so Northwest Greening, Wolf River, actually Forest Winter, from what I hear from our apple expert, Dan Bussey, was came from New York, but it was only ever popular in Wisconsin back in the day. And there's only a few left, but we were, uh, actually those are forest winter apples in that picture. Um, <clears throat> we went to, we've been picking wild apples, um, which I don't know about the rest of the state, but in Southwest Wisconsin, they're everywhere. You can see them in the spring, you drive through the countryside when apples are in bloom and you will see little pinkish white blossoms along you know, fence rows and forest edges and uh, scattered through old pastures and, um, you know, abandoned orchards that maybe were cut down and then the trees sprouted again. So there's there's wild apples all over. And each one of those is different. They're all genetically unique. And um, so we picked some of those too. And um, there's some heritage Wisconsin, or heritage Midwestern cider apples that we got actually from Dan Bussey's old place. Um, and some English cider apples, which are, you know, not a lot of, they're not available in huge quantities, but we were able to scrounge up a few. Anyhow, so that's, that's kind of a background about us and how we're trying to start this business. Um, but in doing all this, it's, it's really helpful to have a little bit more information about uh, what different apple varieties might lend to a blend. Um, and, you know, just to understand our raw, raw materials. Um, and the idea of these single varietal evaluations isn't necessarily to say, like, this is the apple we want to make cider with just this one. It's more to say, okay, what's this apple have? And if I blend with it, what's it going to do? Um, so last year, we did a project that was very similar, um, but we did it as a farmer rancher grant through SARE. And if any of you are have orchards or vineyards and uh, and you are farmers you can apply for these they're great grants we got so if you have you know something like like us we, we had a researchable question what is you know what do different apples and lend to a blend uh, you can you can apply and, and we got funded and we were able to test uh, 40 different varieties uh, in our basement in fact <laughs> but uh, so you know we were a little more official this year doing it at UW um, so anyhow, last year when we did it, these are photos of some of the varieties. Um, uh, and we did the same thing. We tested the bricks and we tested the acidity and pH and the tannins. Um, and you can't see it all on here, but I have each one. This was a poster I had done previously and you can they're all written in there. Um, but if you wanna see detailed um, results of that, those 40, you can, we actually have them on our website. Is this going to work if I click the link? There we go. Yeah, so you can, you know, we got them all up here. Um, you can scroll through. Say, I want to know about uh, black gillyflower, uh, which actually turned out to be a really tasty cider, if I remember right. Um, you know, you got a picture of the apple, a quick description of the apple, our juice analysis, a description of the cider, and then a photo of the cider. Um, which on this particular screen looks green, green and muddy and ugly, but it was actually a nice golden uh, cider. But, um, so anyhow, you can explore that if, if you want some more information on, on different varieties that we tested that first year. And that year we did it a little different. We got sort of a mix of some common eating apples and some more traditional cider apples and some heritage you know, heirloom apples. And so it's really quite a mix. And, and it was fun to compare them and see which ones, at least in our opinion, uh, made the best cider. Um, so I just wanted to give a few general observations about, um, from both of these, you know, this is the one that's ongoing. They're still doing some more tastings along with uh, the one we did last year. Um, and first general observation is that perceptions of flavor are really complex and taster preferences are variable. Um, you know, so it, Michelle showed that uh, graph where the, you know, the apples were kind of scattered all around. And what you couldn't see on that graph is one way, one direction was uh, bitterness, another direction was astringency, another direction was um, acidity, and another direction was sweetness. 
And I had sort of it hypothesized that there would be a sweet spot where, you know, people's favorite cider was, you know, a little bit astringent and kind of sweet and kind of bitter and kind of acidic. But in looking at the overall, you know, the favorites, they were all over the place. Um, so it, that sort of confuses me. I don't, I'm not sure where to go with that other than to think that um, there could be other subtle qualities that are, are um, determining what, what makes a person like one cider over another. Uh, and it could just be the taster preferences. You know, different people like different ciders. And, and any of you, there's, I'm sure there's winery owners in the room here who have done countless winery tastings, and you experience that every day where different people like different things. Um, Another general observation is we should take the data with a bit of a grain of salt because there are a lot of potential confounding factors. Uh, that's me with some Wolf River apples, which are huge. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of other things besides just the variety that can influence the flavor of a cider. So, and, and we don't know with a lot of detail how these different factors how important each one is. So management practices on your orchard. I've seen a study showing that if you thin your apples, you're going to actually get lower total phenols. Um, so that's just one, you know, one example of something you can do a management practice uh, where if you don't, if you want tannins, don't thin your apples because you're you're reducing the phenols by thinning them. That was a study. I think Greg Peck did that over in Cornell, um, you know, growing conditions uh, obviously are going to affect the qualities of an apple uh, where, you know, there's always the terroir of different growing uh, locations can affect it, the timing of the harvest. A lot of um, commercial apple growers pick their apples when they're kind of 75, 80% ripe. Um, because they're still real firm and crisp and they'll stay good in a cooler for a little longer. Uh, but for cider, you want it, at least general thinking is you want it as ripe as you can get it. So you wait a little bit longer, unless they all start to drop. And then <laughs> with some English cider varieties in particular, they're kind of, uh, they never selected for the ones that don't drop because they can pick them off the ground in the UK, but we, we got to pick them from the tree. It can also impact the flavor a lot too. Yeah. Right. Exactly, and and the bricks is going to change as the season goes on, and depending on rain and other things, there's a lot of factors that can throw it off. Um, Nick also mentioned, you know, um, he mentioned how a really high pH or low acidity apple. The, when you ferment it by itself, you're, the flavor and aroma profile might be really dominated by oxidation. Um, so if you blend that apple with something that has a higher or a lower pH and higher acidity, it might act very differently or you'll get different flavors out of it. So there's, you know, that's another compounding factor. Or different yeasts and different fermentation conditions might exemplify certain features of one apple or a different apple differently than than this particular yeast in this ex particular experiment. So there's a lot. Um, some other general um, observations from my perspective is I, I have been pleasantly surprised that some of the Wisconsin apples and even some wild apples have, um, in my mind, stood up to the more gold standard apples out there, which are the English cider are kind of the, the gold standards. And, and an example, well, it's one example is this Wisconsin russet, which I got from Albion Prairie Farm. Um, and it just pops. It, this was from last year's test, and it, it just had a huge flavor, big mouthfeel. It's almost kind of tropical, bright, um, acidic, high, high pH, and then a bit of astringency just to kind of balance it out. So that was a great I thought it was a great tasty cider. Um, this Berger apple is actually a wild apple that we found um, that was really high tannin. I think it came up as third highest on your total phenolics. And I, it was in my blind tasting when I was in that tasting. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what any of mine were. 
And I scored it just as high as Kingston Black. So, and Kingston Black, is, as many of you know, is kind of the quintessential cider apple. Um, or this is a picture here of that there was a Rupert sweet tree where they have these nice big apples. It's a wild apple tree that we've picked from a couple of years in a row. And, and we fill many bushel boxes from one tree um, with nice big apples that have some astringency or have some tannins and, and uh, pretty nice high bricks. So I think there's a lot to explore with uh, with our local apples. And so my last observation then is we have a lot to learn um, and a lot more experiments to do. So that's all I got. Does anyone have questions for any of us? Yeah. Do you have any plans to um, maybe do a test of harvesting max per se, like at 60% ripeness and then 75 and 90 and like from the same orchard where it's the same growing conditions and the same trees, but you're just picking it at different ripeness levels? I think if you own an orchard, you should apply for a Sarah Farmer Rancher grant <laughs> to do just that. Um, no, I I haven't thought that over, but I think it's it would be an interesting experiment, something worth doing. I'd like to ask you about uh, your your uh, tasting app. Who are these people? Are they doing great wines? Do they drink hard cider? Do they know anything about that stuff at all? Yeah, sure. Um, so our first tasting panel was with 20 people. Um, the farmers that were involved in the project were invited. Um, uh, a number of younger students who are definitely wine and cider drinkers were present. Um, and uh, But we did not collect data on, um, what's that called? Yeah, right, exactly. We didn't, we didn't do that. So we don't have, we can't you know, definitely show that. Our second tasting was with farmers and chefs who were involved in the Farm to Kitchen Collective and um, our collaboration. And um, the uh, so we had some chefs involved in that, you know, people who are professional tasters. Um, uh, we've got um, a tasting <coughs> shortly today. Um, and we're expecting some cider makers there, some people who have experience. One of the questions to be eligible for the tasting today is that you have to be an artisanal um, drinker, like a beer drinker or a wine drinker or a cider drinker already. Um, and then um, uh, uh, Julie Dawson, who is helping us organize the tastings and think about the data in a way that makes some sense, she is um, interested in um, working with the um, farmer partners to um, choose some cider blends, to make some blends. From, I don't know if you saw that email or not. She just came up with this idea. Um, um, to blend some of these ciders together and uh, make some specific blends that then we'd have sommeliers um, test. Um, so she thinks we can get, she, she has access to some sommeliers for that. So it's kind of a, a hit and a miss, but other questions? Go ahead, Peter. I'm just, I'm just curious, like, um, with fresh eating, like an apple with some lots of fly spec on it, you can really taste the hot flavor of that. And I know cider varieties, we have the higher columns for some of the pests and diseases. Um, but did you notice any off flavors from these single variety ciders that had any of those fungal pathogens on the fruit skin? Is that an issue? Um, in my experience, sooty blotch and fly spec don't matter much. Um, maybe if it's extreme and they're just like black and, uh, but uh, yeah, in my experience, I haven't noticed much with that. I think the key is to make sure you obviously don't have any rotten apples in the mix. Um, but I think a bit of scab, I think some scarring, you know, obviously things like sun scalding and stuff that um, might make an apple a second um, doesn't really affect the cider flavor. Um, you know, so I, I think my philosophy is just you, if it doesn't, if there's no punctures, to the skin that are open, and if there's nothing nothing rotting on the apple, uh, I, I I think it's fine for cider, and I have not detected any significant flavor difference from that. 
Um, I don't know, there's probably cider makers in the room who maybe have other philosophies of it. I mean, if, if an apple has, you know, if there's a, an adult, um, say, plum curculio in an apple, you'll see the big hole and from it feeding, and, and I, I'll avoid that apple. If there's, you know, a coddling moth in there, it's possible you can, it'll slide by and you won't see it. I don't know. Um, I think if you had a huge infestation, maybe that would be a problem, but um, which could be an issue with some of the wild apples. Uh, I, I mean, the wild apple cider we made got a silver medal at Gwent Cap last year. <laughs> so there's some, you know, there's somebody telling us it was a good, it was a good cider, and they weren't pretty apples. Um, so who knows? Maybe the yeast like a little bit of protein in there. Yeah, Dan. I would never say that a city flash will find something that they have much more information on. But I'd like to do a comment on the research because, um, considering historically speaking, I think the long action reports from 100 years ago and back was the site of human single varietal ciders are very rarely found by themselves. And I think the kind of research that I was doing was really bad was to isolate these, and then you could really come up, I think, with a group of players as a group of people. Ones that will really make great cider. The rest that don't score as well can be those that you can know, learn from later on. But this kind of research has been done for probably 20 years, so I think it's really kind of like a good effect. Having tasted a few different varieties in the time, uh, there, there are lots of really good apples that I would love to see being scored for this. Well, so again, back on your word of caution, you know, you're fermenting them dry, and, and a lot of your apple flavor, if you will, is carried on your sugars. And so even if add a couple of bricks, it tastes very different than it does when it's dry. And so you can come up with, uh, you know, I mean, you can come up with any uh, cider that tastes completely different, right? just a little bit sweet or something, and get a completely different evaluation. So some of these, even that maybe get sparks of high, let's say, the stringent, but it's just a little bit of sweet, could find a huge sweet spot. Coming to that point too, and this gets back to the demographics question. I wonder too if, if people's palates don't change. If people's palates don't change over time, I was a real big sweet person when I was young, and now I don't want sweet cider at all. Um, so you know, this issue of demographics, I think, really plays into that. If I remember correctly, the um, um, at the cider. Um, meetings that they had last fall, last spring. Um, there was some um, discussion about how the target, um, most of the drinkers of cider are young, younger and female. And there was a real interest in how do we pull in some drinkers from a different demographic, from maybe 30 somethings, 40 somethings, people who are used to drinking wine. So, other questions? I said one last one. Um, the first experiment you ran, Matt, was it the same controls that Nick did? And um, you let it settle before you fermented. You fermented to dry. It was uncarbonated. Um, it was similar, a little bit different. Um, I let them go quite a bit longer to ferment to dry. I actually let them go, I think, eight weeks. Um, I did a primary of two weeks, and then I racked them, and then I let them sit for another uh, six weeks. Um, I did... Uh, I sulfited them in the beginning, but in, and then when I bottled them, I actually just pasteurized them in our sink <laughs> with really hot water um, so that they would be still and stable. Um, what else did I do different? I used Cote de Blanc yeast instead, which I don't think was the wisest choice because it's a little slow and finicky um, compared to, yeah, if I were to do it again, I think like DV10 or something that just gets the job done. Is, is the way to go. Um, what else did I do differently? Oh, as far as pressing, I actually pressed them all in one day, one very long day. <laughs> um, you know, so they were all kind of at the same temperature and and I picked them all. So that's an interesting note is I, I picked them all late in the season. Um, so I only really had, they're pretty much exclusively late season apples. Uh, with the exception of a, f I didn't quite have the full 40, so I bought some at the same time from an orchard. Um, 
And so uh, I think it was 10 of the 40 came from that orchard. So I bought 10 and I picked the other 30 all within a couple of days of each other. Um, so, it, and that again is not, it's tricky to make the ideal experiment because you, you know, you want to, maybe the best way to do it is do like an iodine test and say, okay, this one is 100% ripe. Now is the time to pick this one. And, um, but that's really hard to do with 40 varieties when you, you know, have the rest of your life. <laughs> um, I'd say they're comparable in the sense that if, you know, if, if an apple is super bitter, it's probably a bitter apple. If apple is super acidic, it's probably acidic. But as far as like the real finer notes of, you know, is this one a 7.0 grams per liter malic and this one's 7.5, I mean, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, who knows. We had two Liberty apples, one from Cider Farm and one from Cider House, and they tested differently. So um, this issue of location and weather and year and all of those things could, pardon? I think uh, one of them was picked a week or two earlier than the other as well, so. Uh, I have a question for you on the sweetness. Can you, if, do you stop the uh, fermentation or can you back sweeten and get the same taste back? You can do it either way. I, I, I can tell you commercially, it's often sweet re sweet. Just, you know, but is it, you know, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to give you your highest quality, but if you're trying to, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're trying to make two different ciders, one batch of base one. You leave one dry, you can sweep the other, you have two different sizes. 